start with the name of Allah Almighty, who is the most beneficent and the most merciful. May his peace, mercy and blessings be upon you. Good morning to everyone over here. Welcome ladies and gentlemen, honorable chief guests, respected directors and all other guests. I, Sana Salim, PhD student from Health Biology Lab in the Department of Physiology, Government College, University, Faisalabad. And today, you are MC of this oral talk session. And I feel privileged to welcome you all to the first International Brain and Biomedicine Conference, IBBC 2023. I warmly welcome our speakers and delegates across the globe. Thank you so much for joining us on time. The main aim of this conference is to enhance and share your knowledge. It is for the betterment of students and researchers as well. Today, we will have a plenary session and discussion on anatomy, physiology, and epidemiology of neurological and, bio -met and metabolic disorders. Today, we will have a plenary session and discussion on anatomy, physiology, and ep epidemiology of neurological and metabolic disorders. We will discuss the impact on present and how detrimental it can be inclusive. As I word discussion on methods and suggestions for reducing the same at various levels will be discussed. We are also eager to hear our delegates about their ideas and innovation in this field. So let's move toward our first presenter. Our first presenter is Razia Kosser, University of Agriculture, Faisalabad. She is going to present her presentation under the topic of age-related gross morphometry and histomorphometry changes in pineal gland and plasma molecular profile in vitro cord during breeding season. My name is Dr. Razia Kosar and uh, I'm from Department of Anatomy, University of Agriculture, Faisalabad. And the topic of my today's presentation is age-related cross morphometrical and histomorphometrical changes in the pineal gland and plasma melatonin profile in beetle goats during breeding season. So this here is the outline of the, my presentation. So first of all, introduction. Uh, the mammalian pineal gland, uh, which is an integral part of the brain and anatomically it is situated in the medial depression which is formed between the two thalami and colliculi of carpora quadri gemina posteriorly. So this is the exact location of the pineal glands and they act as a neuroendocrine transducer and receives the external stimuli from retina of the eye and circadian rhythms from suprachiasmatic nuclei. And then they transform both of them into the hormonal response in the form of melatonin and melatonin which plays an important role in the reproductive activity in seasonal breeders. So here is the schematic diagram showing the complete mechanism for the synthesis of melatonin from the pineal gland. Now the objectives of the my study is to evaluate the gross morphological and histological changes in the pineal gland in relation to age and plasma melatonin profile. Mm. Yeah. For the, uh, this experiment, total of 24 healthy female goat, beetle goats were selected from the local laboratory of Faisalabad. Their health parameters were also checked uh, before slaughtering and they are divided into three age groups, pre-pubertal, pubertal and post-pubertal groups. And the age of the animals were estimated by dentition and before slaughtering, 10 animal blood was collected. In the vacuum tenors and after slapping, heads of the animals were collected for the collection of the pineal glands from the brain. For the gross anatomical measurements, weight of the pineal glands, length, thickness and volume were recorded. And uh, for this stereological procedure, which is called Cavillary's direct estimator method, it is used for the calculation of the volume. And for the light microscopic studies, Tissues of the pineal gland were fixed in the solution of 10% buffer, a neutral buffer formalin, and then further processed by the routine tissue paraffin technique. We also uh, preserve the tissues in the bovine solution also. So we run two uh, parallel 
with the different two different fixatives. And the section of five uh, micron meter thickness taken with the help of rotary semi-automatic microtome and staining was done with hematoxin and aerosin. And one kusa stain is also uh, used for the determination of calcium deposits in the form of brain sand. And histomorphometry was done with the help of image J analysis software. Blood samples were centrifuged to collect plasma and then hormonal analysis was done by using the commercially available goat melatonin ELISA kit. One way analysis of variance under factorial design using the descriptive statistics software statistics was used and for the significance of the test which is measured by Techies Honest Test. Now results, the first of all, location and the uh, shape of the pineal gland, there was over to roughly triangular, pine cone shaped organs and they are located in the medial depression formed between the two thalami and the color of the gland was pink in pre-pubertal and pubertal groups and it was pink in color while in post-pubertal animals it was light pink to white in color. And the significant difference was found <coughs> in the length of the gland and it is found highest in the post-pubertal uh, post group and lowest in the pre-pubertal group. And the mean thickness of the pineal gland in three groups and it is highest, uh, it is uh, non-significant difference was found in the thickness of the gland. The mean volume of uh, pubertal group was significantly greater than that of the pubertal group and significantly lower than that of the post pubertal group. And the pineal gland was covered by the thin tunic of fibrous connective tissue capsule which penetrates into the parenchyma of the gland and partially divides it into, into the lobules. Now, the parenchyma of the gland consists of various types of cells, pinellocytes and sportive glial cells or astrocytes. Now, this is its schema, the histomorphometrical image. Now, you can see these are the pineal glands and <clears throat> astrocytes. The brain sand also called as carpora arenacea. Uh, actually, carpora arenacea is the deposits of the calcium in the blood vessels. You can see this is the carpora arenacea, which was also found scattered among the parenchymal cells of the gland. Uh, parenchymal percentage in different age groups was found. Uh, it is uh, highest in pre-pubertal group, which is followed by pubertal and um, significantly lower in post-pubertal group. Now, the pinellocytes were abundant while the astrocytes were scared, <coughs> scared in number. The brain sand also called, which is called the carporadinacea, it is the deposits of the calcium and they are found among, scattered among the parenchyma cells of the gland and the parenchymal percentage in different age groups were found highest in prepubertal group. Uh, the parenchymal cell percentage was significantly different among the age groups, which was highest in pre-pubertal group and lowest in post-pubertal group. And the mean values for area of corrective tissue in pineal gland of pre-pubertal, pubertal and post-pubertal groups are, and it is highest in pubertal. And the mean percentage of connective tissue of pubertal group was significantly higher than that of the pre-pubertal group. And the percentage area, percentage area of the blood vessels, it was highest in pre-pubertal group and lowest in post-pubertal group. And number of pinellocytes in pre-pubertal group and post-pubertal groups were uh, 4.8, 7.8 and 7.28. Uh, this is the graph showing the percentage and these are the different parameters like parenchyma, connective tissue, brain sand and blood vessels and uh, different graph bars show the pre-pubertal, pubertal and post-pubertal and you can see that the parenchyma is highest in pre-pubertal pre -pubertal, and the connective tissue is highest in the post-pubertal group 
and the brain cell is also highest in the post pubertal group and blood vessels they are highest in pre pubertal groups so these are the different uh, histomorphographs uh, with the help of uh, uh, they are stained with hematoxin and eosin and one pusa showing the light microscopic structure of the pineal gland uh, different uh, pinealocytes, glial cells, and blood vessels. We can see the connective tissue, and then uh, a carpora uh, erinacea. And the mean percentage of brand sand area in yeah, already I have told you in the graph, so there is no need to repeat it. Uh, this slide is also described in the graph. Now, uh, at the end, we conclude that the age affects the gross and post-histomorphology of the pineal gland and age also affects plasma melatonin level and ultimately it affects the physiology of the body, especially the reproductive physiology in seasonally breeding uh, species. These are the references. And thank you so much. Be kind to your mind. Thank you so much, Desia Kosa, for your valuable time. And now we look forward to our next presenter, Shirina Mehdu, Lyakut National School of Physical Therapy. She is going to present her research work, Association of Compassion, Fatigue, Empathy, and Personality Traits among Physiotherapy Students and Professionals. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Firstly, I would like to thank Government College University Faisalabad for giving us an opportunity to present our research in International Brain and Biomedicine Conference 2023. My name is Dr. Sharina Mahboob and the topic that I'll be presenting on behalf of my team is Association of Compassion Fatigue, Empathy and Personality Traits among Physiotherapy Students and Professionals. I would also like to thank Dr. Sonia Arshad, our supervisor, and my group members, Dr. Ariba Khan and Dr. Sayyid Javeria for their valuable contributions in the research throughout. So the objective of this study was to explore the link between uh, personality traits, empathy, and compassion fatigue in physiotherapy students and professionals. As we all are aware that physiotherapists play a critical role in rehabilitating the irreversible disorder and managing many degenerative diseases. So for any human-related profession, it is really necessary to have caring characteristics such as empathy and compassion. Though we believe that physiotherapists are not the first respondents in trauma, but they are long-term caregivers for the patient. And so we find it very important to uh, discover the psychological aspect of physiotherapists. So our research started from uh, distribution of the questionnaire through social network. So recruitment of the participants was conducted by, uh, by giving e-survey questionnaires. After three reminders, we got an, uh, a sample of 314 participants and this was also calculated from the open API formula of sample sizes. So as we move on to the methodology, uh, so the recruitment of participants started from 500 and we ended up to uh, recruiting 314 participants out of which 192 were physiotherapy students while 122 were physiotherapy professionals. So who are our study participants? As we are aware, physiotherapy students and professionals, but the inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria was defined. So physiotherapy students with clinical experience like fourth and final year was included. Professionals uh, having maximum of eight years of clinical experience. When we talk about sample sizes, as I told earlier that it was calculated through open API formula. Three instruments used to calculate these variables. First was compassion fatigue short scale. Another was big five inventory short scale. And third was Jefferson scale HPS version. So the results of the participant characteristics are here as follows. 
Firstly, 88.5% uh, students were female, while 51.56% in professionals were female. So the majority of the uh, participants were female. Another important participant characteristic was that we, we divided our uh, students and professionals into five groups, fourth year, final year, trainee physiotherapists and physiotherapists with one till five years of experience and physiotherapists will with five to eight years of experience. As we move on, uh, we have area of interest. So majority of the participants, the half of the population uh, of the sample size was uh, interested in the OPD setup. Okay, the third thing which we'll be discussing is uh, in re results is relationship of empathy and clinical experience. So as we move on to this first chart, this shows that uh, em empathy decreases as the clinical experience increases. And when we talk about compassion fatigue, it is 35.5 for students and for professional it is 45. So we can see that empathy score is more in students while in professionals, the compassion fatigue score is more. When we talk about uh, personality traits, we have five personality traits, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, neuroscepticism, and openness. Out of these five, the researchers have uh, proven that neuro neurocitism is uh, found to be the negative characteristic personality trait, while the other four were uh, positive. So when we talk about uh, their comparison in students and professionals, so neurocitism is found to be a slightly higher in professionals. So we do not take mean as a central deviation, a central tendency, because it can deviate the result due to extreme uh, values. And so median is the best choice for uh, non-normal distribution. Therefore, we have taken median as our central uh, tendency measure. Now, when we move on to the major result, which is man whitney u test and Spearsman correlation test. So when we use this uh, test, we can compare the variables in two groups. So here is the result shown. Uh, for example, when we take uh, compassion fatigue as, as an example, so the value is 0 0.029 and the decision is to reject the null hypothesis. As we all are aware, the null hypothesis states that there is no uh, difference in variable uh, in both the groups, students and professionals. But a result has found that there is a, a significant amount of um, difference in both the groups. And so the empathy score also differ in both the groups. So the personality traits uh, uh, have a very variable um, uh, view. So now we move on to Spearman's correlation. It is a non-parametric test that is used to uh, measure the association between the variables. So we have three variables, empathy, compassion fatigue, and personality trait. So when we compare these, uh, we can interpret the data in a form that compassion fatigue is correlated with the empathy, uh, but it is negative correlation. So the negative sign here shows if one, uh, one variable increases or the value of one variable increases, the other one decreases. But empathy and positive characteristics like extraversion, agreeableness and conscientiousness along with openness uh, seem to be positively and directly correlated with positive characteristics like extraversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness. These are positively related or directly correlated with the empathy. Well, if we uh, see this uh, column of the table, here it is shown that compassion fatigue is related to uh, empathy, which is negative correlation, as we have all uh, seen it here as well. And uh, when we compare it to the uh, uh, the personality traits. So we can find that conscientiousness and agreeableness, which are uh, positive characteristics, are negatively related to your indirect relationship uh, to uh, compassion fatigue. Our discussion here uh, is what we have found in the current study and what uh, we have found in the literature. Uh, how it differs or how much 
they both complement each other so the current study uh, result reflected that physiotherapy professionals had a higher level of compassion fatigue and lower level of empathy when we compare to student group so the professionals were having higher level of compassion fatigue as compared to students but according to uh, disusa and devi uh, in 2022 uh, sorry in 2020 they found that compassion fatigue is more common in young physiotherapists another contradictory results were found when we uh, compare that uh, several studies have found that empathy can uh, can remain steady can rise or can decline this variable uh, is likely to be related to cultural factors environmental factors and curriculum so um, our study concluded that uh, the, there was a negative relationship of empathy with the clinical years of passing a research done on indian physiotherapists revealed that compassion fatigue is higher in rehabilitative unit and then uh, it follows through uh, icu and OPD setup. While in our findings, compassion fatigue was uh, prevalent in physiotherapists working in rehabilitation unit followed by OPD and IC. While when we compare empathy uh, to the compassion fatigue, it was found that empathy was related to more of positive personality traits like agreeableness, extroversion, and openness. But here also we found a contrasting uh, result of uh, another study which highlighted that compassion fatigue was associated with agreeable and conscientiousness. So what were the limitations of the study? So first was that uh, there was no causal relationship found uh, between the variables. So we cannot say that the, this uh, particular variable uh, is the cause of the other variable. So we have only founded the association among the three variables and we have compared them in two groups. The another uh, uh, limitation of the study was convenience sampling and small size uh, sample size. So convenience based sampling and small sample size both limit the generalizability of the results to the whole population so it is important to note that the results cannot be generalized next we move on to uh, last part that is conclusion uh, in conclusion we can say that the level of empathy and compassion fatigue both differ in physiotherapy students and professionals and big five personality traits were uh, correlated with the self-reported measures of empathy and compassion fatigue these are the references uh, from where we have uh, taken uh, our material. And thank you so much for your time. And uh, uh, I wish all of you a very good luck for your future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharina, for your valuable time. Our next presenter is Kiran from Lyakar University of Medical and Health Science, John Shor. Kiran from fourth. Assalamu alaikum. This is Kiran from fourth year and this from the University of Medical and Health Sciences, I'm sure. The topic of my presentation is to compare the difference of lipid profile of premenopausal and postmenopausal women of age 45 to 60 and what changes leads to increased risk of cardiovascular diseases in postmenopausal women. Cardiovascular diseases are a major cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide. Studies have shown that women are at lower risk of developing cardiovascular diseases than men. But this advantage seems to abolish once she reaches a stage of menopause. Menopause refers to cessation of ovarian function and transition of a female body from reproductive to non-reproductive phase of life. When a female reaches menopause, her body experiences several changes like heart flashes, night sweats, mood swings, etc. Research shows that estrogen has cardioprotective effect that makes a female less susceptible to developing cardiovascular diseases. At menopause, the abrupt decrease of estrogen causes postmenopausal women prone to develop any heart-related diseases. Through this study, we compared different factors that can be cause of more prevalence of diseases in postmenopausal women when compared to premenopausal women. The objective of our study are to compare the lipid profile of premenopausal and postmenopausal women 
assess the changes in lipid profile after achieving menopause, changes in BMI, waist and chest circumference between these two groups. This is a cross-sectional study. We collected the blood samples and filled the questionnaire form from the patients in hospitals of Hyderabad. The inclusion criteria are the healthy postmenopausal female who have reached menopause one to five years back and women of 40 to 55 years who have not achieved menopause yet. Female who have achieved menopause less than one year back or more than five years back are excluded from this criteria. Assalamu alaikum. This is Kiran from fourth year MBBS from Yakut University of Medical and Health Sciences, Jamshed. The topic of my presentation is to compare the difference of lipid profile of pre and post menopausal women of age 45 to 60 and what changes leads to increased risk of cardiovascular diseases in post menopausal women. Cardiovascular diseases are a major cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide. Studies have shown that women are at lower risk of developing cardiovascular diseases than males. But this advantage seems to abolish once she reaches a stage of menopause. Menopause refers to cessation of ovarian function and transition of a female body from reproductive to non-reproductive phase of life. When a female reaches menopause, her body experiences several changes like hot flushes, night sweats, mood swings, etc. Research shows that estrogen has cardioprotective effects that makes a female body less susceptible to developing cardiovascular diseases. At menopause, the abrupt decrease of estrogen causes postmenopausal women more prone to develop any heart-related diseases. Through this study, we compared different factors that can be a cause of more prevalence of disease in postmenopausal women compared to premenopausal. The objective of our study is to compare the lipid profile of pre- and post-menopausal women, assess the changes in lipid profile after achieving menopause. We also study changes in BMI, waist, and chest circumference between these two groups. The study is a cross-sectional study. We collected the blood samples and filled the questionnaire from the patients in hospitals of Hyderabad. Healthy postmenopausal women who have reached menopause one to five years back were included in the study, and women of age 40 to 55 years who have not achieved menopause yet were also included in the study. Female who have achieved menopause less than one year or more than five years back were excluded from the study. Okay, uh, this is the age distribution of our population. We have the postmenopausal women. Of 40 to 45 years were 23.3%, 46 to 50 years were 23%, 51 to 55% were again 40%, 56 to 60 years were 13%. And premenopausal women of age 40 to 50, 45 years were 60%, 46 to 50 years were 10%, and 51 to 55 years were 30%. Okay, as we can see that. The total cholesterol level in postmenopausal women were 186.46, which is above normal. And the value of LDL found in postmenopausal women were 114. Compared to premenopausal women, uh, LDL levels of 98. HDL levels were significantly decreased in postmenopausal women, uh, 38.6. Compared to premenopausal women, having HDL levels of average 52.3. BMI was increased, waist circumference was increased, chest circumference found to be increased in post menopausal women. Okay, this is the comparison of LDL and total cholesterol between these two populations. As we can see from the graph, that there were significant increased value of LDL in post menopausal women when compared to premenopausal women. Total cholesterol was also increased in post menopausal women than premenopausal women. This is the comparison of HDL between these two groups. The HDL was significantly decreased in postmenopausal women. As we can see from the graph, the premenopausal women had significantly higher levels of HDL when compared to postmenopausal women. This is the comparison of BMI, waist, and chest circumference between these two groups. 
the PMI was found variable between these two groups. Some patients had increased BMI in postmenopausal women group, and some patients had normal BMI in premenopausal women, and while uh, increased BMI in premenopausal women, too, depending upon the uh, life cycle. Base circumference was increased in postmenopausal women, and cell circumference was also increased in postmenopausal women when compared to premenopausal women. So, in our study, we concluded that there are significant changes in lipid profile of postmenopausal women when compared to premenopausal women. Like there is increased LDL and total cholesterol, which, which can be a cause of increased incidence of cardiovascular diseases in postmenopausal women. SDL levels, which is a good cholesterol, which seem to be decreased after menopause. BMI, waist, and chest circumference were also seen to increase after menopause. So these all results. Uh, suggest that why there are there are increased incidence of cardiovascular diseases in postmenopausal women and premenopausal women due to a sufficient level of estrogen are protected from these diseases. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kiran, to share your amazing work with us. And now our next presenter is Jay Prakash from Lyakut University Medical Health Sciences, Jamshur. He is going to present her research work under the title of Cardiovascular Disease, Diseases Risk Factor Among the Postmenopausal Women of Jamshur. Hello, everyone. I hope you are having a great day today. So, this is Dr. Jay Prakash. And I'm a fourth MBBS student currently studying at Jamshur. Uh, along with me, the co-author of this article, uh, Dr. Mohamed Dan, Dr. Kiran, Dr. Nana, Mubashir Ghani, and Dr. Arsalan Kukil. So, today, the topic of my discussion is to assess the cardiovascular risk factor in postmenopausal women attending a tertiary care hospital in Jamshur. Before starting with my topic today, I would like to uh, provide a little introduction of the main highlight of today, that is cardiovascular diseases. So, according to WHO, CVD is a group of disorder of heart and blood vessel, and it includes coronary heart diseases, cerebrovascular diseases, rheumatic heart uh, diseases, and other conditions. More than four out of five CVD deaths are due to heart attack and strokes. As we all know, the, the primary etiology behind the CVD is the increased uh, risk of accumulation of fatty deposit inside the vessels and then consequently increased risk of de developing clots. So there are a plethora of uh, risk factors which leads to the development of CVD. And, the, uh, and those include genetics, obviously, our age, our poor diet, our bad habits of smoking, our lack of physical activities and others that have their fair share in the development of the CVD. Although we have seen uh, men to be more prone to CVD than for men. However, there is a one specific group of women that is uh, at high risk of developing CVD, that is post-menopause women. So now our question shifts to what is menopause? So menopause is a permanent cessation of menstrual bleeding and insignificant production of our endogenous hormone estrogen. As we all know, menopause can cause many changes in the female body, but that's an other whole topic. So we will leave it for uh, now. But in our study, we focused uh, on the changes that are seen in the human body once they reach their menopause, which could aid in, uh, in the increased risk, uh, increased heart-related diseases in women at that stage. And, and we also have seen increasing evidence that suggests gender-related differences in the anatomy and physiology of the myocardium and that of female sex hormone could modify and alter the course of CVD. So our objectives were to assess the risk factor of developing CVD after menopause, which uh, identify any changes in lipid profile that may lead to CVD and find any association of test or, or waste ratio uh, with the occurrence of CVD in menopause uh, women. So our study was de uh, designed, uh, our study design was cross-sectional study. Uh, the setting was based in hospitals in Hyderabad. 
our sampling technique was non probability convenience sampling. And in our inclusion criteria, we only included those uh, postmenopausal women who have achieved their menopause uh, one to five years back. In our exclusion criteria, we excluded all those uh, participants who have achieved their menopause less than one year or more than five years back. And we also excluded those females who uh, had any known cardiovascular diseases. Our sampling, uh, sample size was consi uh, consisting of 131 participants. So now comes to the results. So uh, as you can see, the descriptive statics, uh, statics of our uh, article, uh, as you can see, the total cholesterol, LDL, and tags are quite high, whereas we can see that HDL is significantly low. And we can see the BMI of the all, all 131 patients is also high. Further, uh, we uh, correlated BMI with the other factors, and we found a strong correlation uh, with, with those factors such as total cholesterol, LDL, uh, waist circumference, and chest circumference. Further, moving on, the uh, number of cases according to the age. And we got the uh, majority of our cases in the age, age group of 46 to 50 years, and uh, which consisted of 61 partic uh, participants, which become a uh, 47 percentage of total of our study. And the second uh, is second largest group was uh, of 40 to 45 uh, years. And that consisted of 38 to 20, uh, 38 participants, which became 29 percentage and so on. Further, we used uh, uh, different variables using ANOVA, uh, ANOVA test, and we kept uh, BMI a uh, dependent uh, factor, and we got significant results here again. Moving on, uh, we uh, considered the family history and smoking history of our patient, and as you can see, majority of our patient, our participants were non-smokers, whereas uh, you can see that uh, majority of our uh, participants has a family history of CVD and it, it shows a strong correlation uh, with these both. Further, uh, we uh, assessed the lifestyle of our participants and we found out that majority of our, our participants were having moderately active lifestyle, whereas a, a minor group was having a very active lifestyle. But, and the moderately one were consisting of those women who were doing the, the casual home chores. So we came to a conclusion that women experience reduction in estrogen pro uh, production, which leads to various changes in the lipid profile, such as reduced HDL, elevated total cholesterol, LDL, and triglycerides. And this became the basis of increased CVD risk in female who have achieved menopause. Since the, these changes are uh, in general are not seen in pre-menopausal women, this group has very less chances of getting cardiovascular diseases. So that's it for today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay Prakash, for your findings. And our next presenter is Fatima Mariam from Kuhart University of Science and Technology. She is going to present her research work under the title of Identification of Risk Factor Associated with the Severity of COVID-19 in Pakistani Population. Assalamu alaikum and hello to everyone. My name is Fatima Maryam and uh, I have recently completed my MPhil in Epidemiology and Public Health from University of Veterinary and Animal Sciences, Lahore. The topic which is I'm going to present today is identification of the risk factors associated with the severity of COVID-19 in the Pakistani population. First of all, we should know that what are coronaviruses? Coronaviruses are one of the largest group of viruses that are enveloped positive sense RNA viruses with a large genome and a unique replication strategy. Previous outbreaks that are caused by these viruses include severe acute respiratory syndrome and Middle East respiratory syndrome. Its first case was 
identified in Wuhan, China in December 2019 and the index case in Pakistan was confirmed on 28 February 2020 in Karachi from travel history from Iran. On February 11, 2020, it was designated as coronavirus disease by WHO and the WHO declared the disease as a pandemic on March 11, 2020. This virus has caused huge health losses, social losses and economical losses. Therefore, keeping in view the significance of the disease, the current study is designed to identify risk factors that are associated with the severity of COVID-19 in the Pakistani population. The main objectives of my study are to identify the risk factors that are associated with the severity of COVID-19 in the Pakistani population and to identify high risk groups and provide evidence to develop target, targeted prevention. Materials and methods. A cross-sectional study was designed to identify risk factors associated with the severity of COVID-19 in the Pakistani population. For this purpose, a questionnaire was developed after review of literature and discussion with medical professionals. Then the questionnaire was pre-tested on some patients and the final questionnaire had 35 close-ended questions. The link to the questionnaire is added here as you can see in this slide. The data on various plausible factors are, is collected from 276 confirmed COVID-19 patients and the patients who had not been tested co positive to COVID-19 and some of the missing cases, uh, some of the cases with missing information was excluded from the study. The data was preferably collected through personal and telephonic interviews. However, a link of the Google form was shared where the patients were not available for a direct interview. All statistical analyses were performed with R for Windows software and R Studio as an interface. Descriptive statistics including percentages were produced for each variable of interest. A univariable analysis was performed using chi-square test to select the potentially associated variables. Then multivariable analysis using ordinal logistic regression was performed on those variables which yielded a p-value less than 0.2. In the final model, the only variable showing a p-value less than 0.05 was retained and the ordinal logistic regression model was operated with the help of polar function. Odds ratio and 95% confidence intervals were produced by x function. Results. This slide shows the demographic characteristics of the patients. We divided our patients into three categories according to the definitions of NIH, and the three categories were mild, moderate, and severe. Out of 276 patients, most of the patients belong to the moderate cases, and some were mild cases but the severe cases were very few. As you can see here, the most of the patients in our data was male patients, were male patients, and uh, the COVID-19 affected although all the ages and all age groups, but most of the infected individuals were of middle age and old age. The uh, frequency of severe cases was higher in old age as compared to other age, age groups. About half of the patients in our study belong to the overweight category and mortality rate in our study was slightly higher in overweight patients as compared to the patients with normal weight. Obesity commonly enhances the severity of respiratory diseases, but it is still not confirmed whether the obese patients are more likely to have greater illness or severity. This 
draft shows that the mortality rate in our study was 6%. Most of the people, about 65% of the people told us that they did not require any hospitalization, but they took treatment at home. And 14% of them required normal ward and room hospitalization. About 8% of them were admitted to ICU and 13% of the patients told us that they did not require any treatment at all. This table shows the signs and symptoms presented by COVID-19 patient. And as we can see that the most common symptoms in them were fever, coughs, and aches. About 59% of patients told us that they totally lost their sense of smell and taste during their disease period. And half of the patients experienced gastrointestinal symptoms such as nausea, diarrhea, and loss of appetite. This table shows us the results of univariable analysis. Different type of comorbidities like cardiac diseases, lung disease, and diabetes were observed in the patients. And the results of univariable analysis showed that the severity of COVID-19 was slightly higher in patients with diabetes and cardiac disease. However, this association could not be confirmed through multivariable analysis. Similarly, Similarly, it was found that the, here you can see this. Similarly, it was found that the severity of disease was significantly less in patients who were routinely taking anti-allergic medicines before and during their disease occurrence. 18% of the patients used ivermectin with or without the prescription of doctor during their course of disease. And 21% of the patients used steroids during their disease period. This table represents the results of multivariable analysis. And the results of multivariable analysis revealed that the age was significantly associated with the severity of COVID-19. And we found that the odds of moving from mild to moderate and moderate to severe category were 44 times higher in patients with age more than 70 years compared to the patients of age less than 30 years. And the odds was 5.9 times more for the age group of 50 to 70 years than the patients of the age group less than 30 years. So we can conclude that the patients over the age of 70 years who were infected with COVID-19 had 44 times higher odds of getting severe disease. Although there was no mortality in patients aged up to 30 years, this does not suggest that they are fully resistant to the disease. 70% of the deaths associated with COVID-19 were found to be among adults of age above 70 years. The most common symptoms found in our study were fever, cough, and aches. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariam. You have great findings and we are feeling pleasure to have you here. And now our next presenter is Fatima Saad from Muller University. She is going to present her presentation under the topic of role of immunological and metabolic factors in the progenesis of diabetes type 1. Hello everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much for having me. I am delighted to be here. What a beautiful day it is. I am so happy to share it with all of you. Thank you for joining me here with this morning. I am Fatma Saad, Assistant Professor of Public Health Department in the Middle University of Science and Technology. I am here to be present my abstract. I am sharing my uh, screen. Present my abstract here. Okay. 
today my topic is my abstract topic is the role of immunological and metabolic factor in the prognosis of diabetes type 1 you know what is diabetes the diabetes type 1 is a disease that seriously affect the lifestyle of the pupil it can conversely stated that the lifestyle of pupil causes this disease diabetes mellitus is a multi system disorder involving all metabolic pathway resulting in the hyperglycemia and glycosuria diabetes cause immense changes in daily routine of patients that leads to mental stress deprivation and depression Here is the prevalence of the diabetes. The actual diabetes is occurring in increase rate of three percent to four percent around the world. This is very significant threats of public health. The scientist Mengis is saying about two thousand and thirteen. It has been predicted that by the year of twenty thirty five, there will be around five ninety two millions of diabetics. The eighty percent of diabetes live in low and middle income countries, and of the total, more than sixty percent live in Asia, with almost one third in China. Type one diabetes is mostly observed in young age group, which poses challenges, management strategies, the attempt to early regulate of blood glucose level, minimize the chance of early development of complications. It is suggested that the immune system, the immune responses, they are cited by genetic and environmental factors, the facilities of development of type one diabetes. Do you know? What is the role of the production of the interleukin two? Could interleukin two be important in the prognosis of diabetes type one? Yes. The rationale of my study is that the importance of diabetes is association of interleukin two with our antibodies and development of diabetes. The present research may prove to be a stepping stone in the unraveling of the underlying alteration in the biochemical process lead to diabetes. Immune system is comprised of several highly effective molecules that play a major role in the development of the disease. Examination of these molecules and the intensity of their correlation may prove to be an unknotting link. Leading to discovery of novel tool for prevention, the early diagnosis and convenient management is reducing the economic burden on society too. Our study methodology: the convenient sample of hundred, the fifty is the cases, and the fifty is the control. The cases are the diabetic patients, and the control are the first degree relatives. The both the cases and the control they should be uh, written in concerned verbal form to inclusion in the study. After the patient of twelve hour or fasting, the verbal written consent was taken. They are the physical examination, the BMI, and the WHR. And after that, the venous blood sample collected and run by the ELISA technique. Both type one diabetic patients and the first degree related. They both are uh, analyzed by chemical parameter and the physical parameter. The chemical parameter we would be run the interleukin two level and the C peptide level, and the physical parameter they are the BMI and WHR. A result can be shows that to some key points of the result, this is the may the potential the possible of development of diabetes in the relatives. The C peptide level, the insulin synthesis also does not differ between two groups. The significantly higher BMI of diabetic diabetic patients may be a factor of persistent C peptide level. Concordant the previous finding that a higher BMI facilitates. Beta cell proliferation and thus the insulin synthesis. Through the BMI has been for ages used an indicator of the obesity. The hip waist hip ratio indicates for fat distributions, distributions, and the WHR is thus a health predictor with respect to obesity related disorders. Abdominal fat is an immense health hazard. Thus, a higher WHR is an obesity related is the disease marker. This graph is shows the correlation of WHR with interleukin two in first degree relatives. They show a positive correlation between WHR and interleukin two in the first degree relatives of diabetes. Abdominal fat is an immense health hazard. 
with a higher WHO is an obesity related and pertain the probability of developing diabetes. This correlation of C peptide with fasting blood glucose, blood glucose sugar in diabetic patient is the negative correlation between FBS and C peptide in diabetic patient. The fasting blood glucose is negatively correlated with the C peptide level in diabetic patient endorsing the depletion of pancreatic activity and resulting in diabetes. Our resulting shows that the interleukin of interleukin family is implicated the regulation as well as the dysregulation of TDAC functions. It is the activity of any of these molecules, these cytokines independently or of more than one cytokine synergistically that leads to release of autoantibody and destruction of the pancreas. Precisely, the induction of Th1 cell influenced by the interleukin 2 leads to activation of cell destructive molecules, secretion of autoantibodies, and beta cell destruction. Our last slide shows that the interleukin 2 being secreted from CD25 cell, and this interleukin 2 along with the IFN interleukin 4 induced cells leading to the activation of macrophages, CD8 cells, IgGB cells, and consequently autoantibodies that damage the pancreas. They are indirectly connected to glucose, C peptide, autoantibody, BMI, and WHR. The C peptide, they are con uh, connected to destruction of the pancreas, decrease release of C peptide and insulin in the presence of hypertonic stress, the induce of interleukin 2. So, autoantibody, the interleukin 2 enhance the TH1 cells that reduce macrophages, phagocytosis, and autoantibodies. And the BMI, the gradual increase of body mass and depth across the lifespan, individual lengths to develop impaired glucose metabolism and the WHR and glucose they are directly connected. The high level of interleukin 2 in diabetic patient as well as their first degree relatives lead to the identification of a common factor in the pathogenesis of diabetes. The absence of difference in the C peptide level may be related to the beta cell inefficiencies of both groups. The negative correlation of C peptide with fasting sugar blood glucose in diabetic patients is potentially support in decline the endogenous insulin synthesis. Today, my topic is enhance the diabetic patient in further interleukin 2 levels and autoantibodies to check the correlation between diabetic patient in related to first degree relative. Hope you all understand my uh, abstract and my topic and enjoying this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fatima Saad, for your findings. And our next presenter is Husna Jurrat from Government College, University of Lahore. Assalamualaikum. My name is Husna Jurrat, and uh, I am doing my PhD from Government College, University of Lahore. And I am glad that I have been offered a chance to present my research work on International Brain and Biomedicines Conference, IBBC 2023. Thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity. The topic of my research, I'm still research is promoting effect of azadi recta indica on mice peripheral nerve regeneration. Problem statement. The problem is peripheral nerve injury affect millions of people. Yes, it is affecting millions of people. Over 200 million people per year are affected by PNI. And 13 to 23 persons per lakh in developed countries are, effect, are affected by peripheral nerve injuries. And injuries resulting, such injuries often result from accident, trauma, and surgical impairments. But unfortunately, only 3% patients are admitted to trauma centers. Introduction. Peripheral nerve injuries affect the sensory and motor functions. Because, for example, in this diagram, we can see that these are sensory organs and these are motor organs, motor and muscle fibers. These red color nerves are called the motor nerves because they are... Uh, 
sending messengers ye messages ye impulses to muscles and these are known as nerves these are known as nerves and they help find they are responsible for sensory for sensory functioning and any disruption in these any injury in these nerves may cause uh, may affect the proper functioning motor and sensory functioning of cells that affect the quality of life as well another problem is nerve regeneration rate is very slow and thus it affects the sensory and motor functioning of nervous systems on average it was reported that any damage or injury in nerves require around 800 days to recover about 800 mm which means on average per day only 1 mm nerve regenerates that is indeed a very small amount so it affects the quality of life and or research was conducted in order to enhance this intrinsic create by using some medicines previously surgeries as well as the other treatments are hyper using to cure pnis but these fda approved treatments were quite expensive so accelerating axonal growth can speed up the functional recovery and traditional medicinal plants are being investigated for promoting effect on recovery process of peripheral nerve injuries as shown in one study this is a control group this is mushroom extract treated group and this is isarin a medicinal derivative of the medicinal plant it was given to the organisms with a crushed mouse models and increased reflex responses were observed in treated group thus we can say that these axonal growth can be speed up by using some pcms and other or cheesems and other medicines medicinal plant and derivatives and nerve regeneration there are many studies that has been conducted so far to find the nerve regenerative potential of many medicines nerve plants and their derivatives so the study used the uh, other director indica leaves extract to find the region its regenerative potential nerve regenerative potential as a director indica is the common name of it's a scientific name of name it is a potential candidate for nerve regeneration due to some primary reasons the one of them is and it has antioxidant properties it has anti inflammatory properties it can show anti apoptotic potential and immunomodulatory features are also one of the key features of the director indica these potentials these properties of neem leaves has been reported in many studies as shown in this neuroprotective effect of the directa indica a standardized extract in partial sciatic nerve injury in rats evidence from anti inflammatory anti oxidant and anti apoptotic studies so the aim and the objectives of our research were investigation of regenerative potential of ai extract on the peripheral nerve regeneration through the behavioral test and then investigating the histological basis of enhanced axonal regeneration in sciatic nerves and then unveiling the underlying mechanisms of regenerative effect of ai all experimental design was based this study for example this is a diagram showing sciatic nerve this is the sciatic nerve the white thread like material is the sciatic nerve of the mouse and in this experiment in this figure we show that sciatic nerve crush injury was performed this nerve was uh, pressed for 30 seconds to give a uh, injury to nerve and uh, it was then trained by uh, it was then trained by for pinprick assay toe spread assay as well as sfi about uh, 24 mouse were taken from government college universities animals house and they were trained for uh, all these three tests and was pre treated with or ai methanolic extract then on the day 0 was these mouse were observers uh, um, received a crush injury on zero day and say from day 3 to 29 behavioral functional behavioral test behavioral test was performed to find the functional recovery pin prick assay and toe spread assay were performed on daily basis from day 3 to 29 after 
peripheral nerve injury and SFI was performed once in a week from day 3 to 29. And there's a baseline line reading observed before giving crush injury was compared with the recovery scores to find the final graphs and to estimate the recovery potential of the data indica. Then histology was performed, sciatic sh nerve extraction. This is a picture showing sciatic nerve extraction. This was a white thread-like material which was previously crushed. It was then harvested in this way and then observed, we are preserved in sciatic nerve is preserved in BSS solution for histological analysis. Histological analysis of gastrocinemas muscle was also performed was uh, some uh, chunks of gastrocinemas muscles of every mouse was taken and it was observed in 24 well micro teacher plate in for having 4% PFA solution for preservation after that histology was performed and micrograph was taken for um, interpreting the results. These were the results of our study as a director indica treated mice weight profile. The mouse of the weight of all the mice during the experiment were Monitored was measured and it was found that there was no significant difference or instant variation near abrupt changes in the weight of every mouse, which shows that the mouse will remain healthy throughout the experiment. Later on, this was the result of pinprick assay. The pinprick assay showed that the mouse receiving methanolic mean extracted 500 mg per kg shows the fastest recovery as compared to the control group. And similarly, the difference between the recovery rate of ME methanolic extract of 5 to 50 mg per kg in Mika was also observed. Thus, we can say that the other director indica treatment enhanced sensory functional recovery showing sciatic nerve crush injury. This was the result of Tosepred assay. The Tosepred assay shows that till seven day from in injury to day seven, there was no motor recovery observing all three members of the groups but later on they started recovery and uh, from day 11 to day 7 in 250 and 500 mg per group fastest in recovery was observed as compared to physical group but this was a mild recovery not a significant difference was found between the, between all these groups the director indica treatment enhances motor functional recovery following sciatic nerve crush, sciatic nerve crush injury, SFI scores. SFI score shows that this was a baseline reading. And again, the AI treated, as a, as a director indica treated mouse shows faster recovery from day week two as compared to the vehicle group that started recovery from third week. So it fastens the nerve regeneration and we can say that the AI treatment, AI indica, yani AI leaves extract treatment can improve the nerve regeneration rate in patients receiving sciatic nerve injury. For the validative results, uh, histological histology was performed in the regenerative genetic nerves and the result shows that uh, the myelination thickness was greater in 500 mg per kg cricket group in as compared to 250 mg per kg group but as compared to vehicle group the myelination was um, Denser, the intensity was greater in 250 mg per kg group. This shows that, uh, as shown in this figure, vehicle group has only 20,000 myelin density AU may, is AU are its units, and the similar 250 mg per kg shows 40,000 myelin density, and uh, 500 mg per kg shows 60,000 AU myelin density, which shows that. Uh, the myelin uh, regeneration, the myelin thickness was greater in AI treated groups. Similarly, enhanced motor axon regeneration and re innervation was observed in 500 mg per kg group. It has more fibers re innervation as shown in this figure. And in the 250 mg, there were fewer myelin uh, re innervating muscles fibers regenerating in 250 mg per kg. And the vehicle group has no, no such vehicle groups, no such re innervation.
So the result of this study was found that uh, found that a study like the Indica enhances restoration of sensory function and recovery in mice using unilateral shattic nerve crush injuries and a study like the Indica treated mice shows an improved but non significant improvement in mouse treated with AI in motor functional recovery and a study like the Indica administration and 250 and 500 mg do not show post dependent effect on peripheral nerve regeneration. And as a, as a director, Indica may be used as an alternative complementary medicine so for the investigation is required. But for future direction, in vivo and in vitro investigation of the director, Indica treatment on expression of regeneration associated genes at MRN level can be performed and estimation of the director, Indica. And the oxygen potential shattic nerve injury models can also be performed to further validate all results. Thank you. And our next presenter is Amina Iqbal from the University of Health and Science. She is going to present her research work under the title of a rare periodic case of idiopathic bilateral optic neuritis, a case report from Karachi. So hello and assalamu alaikum everyone. My name is Amna Iqbal and I'm a third year MBBS student from Dow University of Health Sciences. I'm honored that our abstract, which is titled Audio Pediatrics, Pediatrics Case of Idiopathic Bilateral Optic Uritis is accepted for this International Brain and Biomedicines Conference. It is a case report from Pediatrics Unit 2 at Civil Hospital Karachi that I'll be presenting today. So let's try to understand what is optic neuritis. It is a primary inflammation of the optic nerves. Optic nerves is presented as a typical optic neuritis and atypical optic neuritis. And the case I'm presenting today occurs in one to five times, which means at least uh, it could be like one person in one lakh population per year. The maximum could be the five people from one lakh population one year could present this, which depicts about this case, uh, this case being a rare one. A typical presentation of optic neuritis in children is visual loss uh, from over days to hours, abnormal color vision, visual feed loss, periocular pain, pain with the movement of eyes, um, headache also, and severe decrease in the visual acuity. Moreover, the risk of recurrence is also very high for optic neuritis. So me and my co-authors worked on this case report to bring this rare presentation in medical literature. So I present a case of a 12 year old girl who was born and a resident of Karachi, having the weight of 40 kg. She was fully vaccinated and presented in the OPD with acute severe deterioration of her vision with a headache for last, which lasts for like seven days. So she is a second uh, product of consanguineous marriage and had no visual symptoms initially. So upon inspection, the right and the left visual acuity was limited to the perception of light and she lacked color vision. On cross examination, no visual uh, anomaly was found. There was no pathosis and normal conjunctiva, cornea, iris, sclera were observed. The pupils are bilaterally equal reactive to direct and consensual light reflectance. Moreover, there was no significant history of any chronic or autoimmune illnesses that were noticed. Then we ordered um, the investigations that I'll be talking in detail. So the blood inflammatory markers were normal and negative for viruses and bacteria. Autoantibodies and aquaporin, four antibodies in the CSF were negative. In VEP, which stands for the visual evoked potentials, the report uh, showed that these absolute latencies are prolonged bilaterally, which are suggestive 
of moderate degree of optic pathway dysfunction. Um, we have attached it to the report so that you guys can also have an insight on it. Moreover, the CSF report is also attached to it. The report indicates the protein and the sugar concentration in the CSF. There was no RBCs found and WBCs, um, there is no RBC and WBCs found here. So let's talk about the differential diagnosis, like after doing the cross examination, um, like having all the investigations that we did, all the board tree investigations, now we have to make a diagnosis. So for that, a number of uh, conditions can present with sudden visual loss, and uh, they must be considered in the differential diagnosis. Multiple sclerosis is usually linked to ocular neuropathies. However, optic neuropathies can also be caused secondary due to neuromyelitis optic spectrum disorder, which is usually known as NMOSD, or due to SLE, which is systematic lupus erythematosus, or idiopathic to any other condition, such as um, you know, compressive, ischemic, genetic, um, toxic, or any nut uh, nutritional optic neuropathies. So our patient doesn't have encephalopathy. So ADM was ruled out. Um, MRI and CSF were normal. No lesion and no significant history of multiple sclerosis was found. So as of yet, multiple sclerosis and NMOSD wasn't here. Moreover, we ruled out somatic lupus arthritis again, but there's no significant history and there was no joint pain. So after diagnosis and appropriate investigations, the final uh, diagnosis as of yet is Idiopathic, um, idiopathic optic neuritis. So let's talk about the limitations and um, the conclusion to the last part of the presentation. Her mutual acuity is, was gradually improving after we gave them IV, methyl, pedins, and all. The color vision was also gained back. Uh, patient was discharged on tablet delta cordial. Delta cordial. So Unfortunately, um, we talk about um, uh, uh, optic neuro neuropathies in general. So unfortunately, there is no definitive treatment for optic neuritis for children. While um, the corticosteroids are usually recommended for children, which are found supportive to our patient also. MOG uh, antibodies and oligocanal bands were not performed, which is a limitation because the funds weren't there. However, a virus PCR test can be performed to exclude optic neuritis secondary to viral infections. Physicians should be aware of these unique optic neuritis symptoms and should not be surprised by such a case. In summary, a patient has idiopathic optic neuritis from which she had made a speedy recovery with no relapses after six months of follow-up. And um, that brings the end of my presentation and I would now be interested to hear from you. You guys can like drop it in the chat, um, like in the comment section of this um, video about your thoughts and any follow-up questions. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, I hope it clears your idea about this year presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amna. Thank you so much, all of you, to participate in this session. Now, the next session will be contributed by my another colleague. Thank you so much. I love this.